thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, where we look back on significant cars from Australian roads and racetracks. In each episode, we examine what made our feature car stand out and take an up-close look at an owner's well-preserved example. We'll also get a market update from the Shannon's auctions team. In today's episode, we're taking things off-road in the British icon, which created a new class of all-terrain vehicle, the first-generation Range Rover. In my view, the Range Rover was the second most significant vehicle of the 20th century after the Model T. With its smooth V8 engine, plush ride, delightful handling, unmatched ability over any kind of terrain and unique styling, the Range Rover was the true precursor of this century's luxury SUV. Like so many of the greatest inventions, the Range Rover's origins seem surprisingly simple. And at this point, it's important to acknowledge that the Land Rover was itself heavily influenced by the Willys Jeep. The idea of a more comfortable and car-like Landy dates back to the Land Rover station wagon of October 1948, a sales flop. Next came a 1952 prototype Road Rover based on the 1950 P4 sedan. Further prototypes followed. The Series 2 Road Rover of 1956 underpinned the ideas that eventually crystallised in the Rangey. In 1966, work began on the 100-inch station wagon, the 100 referring, of course, to the wheelbase. A decisive factor was doubtless the promised ex-Buick 3.5-litre V8 engine. Mark, it's difficult to overestimate the importance of that engine, not just to the Range Rover, mm. but when you think about it, to international motorsport. Oh, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, it, was mm. a, it was a distant relative to the Repco Brabham V8 that uh, Jack Brabham won the 1966 World Formula One Championship with. But yeah, it was also used in all sorts of competition cars, the Triumph TR8 rally cars, those booming monsters. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, the Group A Rovers that Tom Walkinshaw Racing had so much success with in the 1980s. And, uh, and then of course we had the 4.4 litre derivative for the P76, which actually played a starring role in the 1977 London to Sydney Rally, which I'll get to a bit later. On 17 June 1969, the Range Rover was unveiled in West Cornwall. The specification was unique. Massive box section chassis, beam axles front and rear, Boga Hydromat self-leveling rear suspension, panard rod and long forged steel radius arms locating the front axle, four wheel discs, 135 horsepower, 3.5 litre V8, four speed gearbox with two speed transfer case. Traditional Rover engineering abounded. For example, in the use of aluminium alloy for the outer skin panels, just like the Land Rover and the P4 sedan. Power steering came later, Automatic transmission, a four-door body and luxurious cabin came much later. An upspec Vogue variant appeared in 1981. 1986 brought a major facelift with horizontal grille bars and cleaner detailing. Belatedly, improvements kept coming, though build quality was never brilliant. Fuel injection, longer wheelbase variants and bigger engines of 3.9 then 4.2 litres. The classic variant appeared in 1995, the year after the new generation P38A Range Rover was introduced. Mark, that combination of tunable V8 engine, mm. triple differentials and brilliant dynamics made the Range Rover a natural for rallying, I'm thinking. Yeah, it sure did. And it certainly proved it too. Over 30,000 kilometres from London to Sydney. The game-changing original Range Rover could not only tackle the toughest tracks and off-road obstacles, it was also an outstanding long-haul tourer that could cover vast distances with great safety and comfort regardless of road and weather conditions. It was these attributes which ensured the Rangey would also be thrust into major expeditions and competitions, primarily in marathon events which played to its strengths. Highlights include the 1971 expedition from Alaska to Cape Horn via the vast Pan-American Highway, which included conquering the all but impenetrable jungle of the highway's missing link, the Darien Gap. It also holds the distinction of winning the first Paris-Dakar Rally in 1979, 
a feat it repeated two years later. And it was also the weapon of choice for two Camel Trophy adventure challenges in which it excelled in the jungles of Sumatra and Papua New Guinea. John, you know, the Range Rover had full-time four-wheel drive locking centre def. You know, it seemed that it could conquer just about any off-road challenge at the time, didn't it? Yeah, look, there was never any issue mm. that it, would, it was the best off-road vehicle for quite a long time after it came out, mm. for, for, for many years. And I, I remember, I think the first time I saw one, maybe 73 or something, a lovely new car, mm. someone, someone said, oh, you'd never take that off-road. <laughs> of course, I... That people are now taking the Bentley Bentayaga off road, yeah. I imagine, somewhere. Mm, mm. But it, it was a unique vehicle. And a lot of that uniqueness had to do with the fact that you really could drive it anywhere a vehicle could go, and no other vehicles could go where the Range Rover could go. Mm. And wasn't it interesting, though, the way it started in a fairly u utilitarian form? And then it just became this luxury thing really started to take Absolutely. over to the point where the later models. You could see them on the street and you could just about guarantee that they will never see a dirt road. The, oh, whole, the whole thing's changed. That's, they used to advertise used Range Rovers as having, you know, done the tough yards in Turak and <laughs> yeah, raw clues. That's Turak how they used taxi. to ad advertise it. Yeah. But um, JRA, who was the distributor at the Jaguar Rover Australia, used to take the media to really fabulous mm. wilderness locations just to show what a great vehicle the Range Rover yeah, was. Yeah, that, that was right, because even though it had leather interior and all the yeah. luxury options, they yeah. take it off-road and say, well, it can still go off-road and very effectively. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Interesting stuff. Another motorsport milestone was the Aussie class victory in the 1977 London to Sydney Rally. This was achieved by the Leyland Australia-backed crew of Evan Green and John Bryson in a Range Rover powered by a larger aluminium 4.4-litre V8 designed for the P76. Green said he chose the Range Rover because it offered a good compromise between the speed and comfort of a car and the body-on-frame ruggedness and off-road ability of a four-wheel drive. It was a hand-built rally weapon, light yet strong, with three fuel tanks delivering a combined 1,000-kilometre driving range. Before the start in London, smart money was on the small number of four-wheel drive entries having a crucial advantage in the Iranian and Australian deserts. However, there were none of the rumoured horror stretches, and the high-riding off-roaders faced a distinct disadvantage against the top car-based crews throughout the event. The Green Bryson Range Rover showed a great turn of speed in the early stages, but a bad tank of fuel in Iran and other delays cost them crucial time. Even so, finishing 11th outright and first in the four-wheel drive division proved once again that the Range Rover was the class of the four-wheel drive field from the dunes of Dakar to the rugged Australian outback. Don't forget, you can join the conversation on the Shannon's Club forums with a host of interesting topics. My name is David Belford and this is my 1975 Suffolk D Range Rover. Had the car for about three years. The previous owners have done a fantastic job in maintaining the car and keeping it in a sensational condition. It's very unusual to find these old Range Rovers in this sort of nick, so I immediately snapped this car up. As you see, it is how I bought the car. Most Australian Range Rovers were delivered through the truck and bus division, hence this car's got a little Leyland badge the Australian delivered cars didn't get the famous UK bonnet mirrors. They got put onto the doors and we also had to have a headrests on the seats as well. The interior is original. It's got new carpet, power steering and air conditioning. It's got all of its original documentation, even the original sales receipt. One of the previous owners kept a really documented notebook with all of the mileage, the places that he visited. The car's got an incredible history. The cars were built with an all aluminium 3.5 litre V8 with twin SU carbies. A lot of people were driving these cars in the outback and through remote areas, so you needed a car that was basic and very easy to work on mechanically. Really enjoyable to drive. They've got a fantastic glass house, very thin pillars. And they're a very comfortable car. Suspension's really quite soft, which helps it off-road, but it also makes it very comfortable to drive on the road. 
Being such a capable car, they've been used in plenty of long distance rallies like the Dakar. We've got a pretty long history with Shannon's. We've got about seven or eight cars insured with Shannon's purely because I know it's an easy process. My future plans with this car, I'm just going to keep it forever, just enjoying it as a family car. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon has dropped by to give us all the latest on the first generation Range Rover. Welcome, mate. Hello, Mark. How are you? Yeah, John. Welcome, Chris. Uh, the Range Rover. Mm. There's a lot to say about it, oh, isn't there? Oh, boy. I mean, yep. especially in Britain, I mean, oh. they're commanding enormous money. Is that begin going to happen here too? Look, we, we're definitely seeing that trend coming through. It's I, a global know, thing, isn't it? It's a global, global theme. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know... It's an incredible car. It's been, you know, the production of that original body was 25 odd years. Yeah. And nobody would have thought when they finally belatedly brought out a four-door version that the, the, the two-door would be the one that the car right. had brought. <laughs> right. yep. you know, yeah. yep. It's extraordinary. So, so the first of them, yeah, I mean, uh, they're known as Suffolk's A cars and uh, 71, 72 models. They're about the most sought after two-door. So that's, you that's the 100-inch wheelbase, two-door body. Correct. And inside they were quite utilitarian. Very plain. Like so, so, so that's the one that's, that's at the, the top one, of the tree. That's the one, correct. I mean, uh, we're seeing you know, the price of those in the UK, you know, skyrocketed and uh, they're about the most sought after you can get. And I think Incredible. the only reborn Range Rovers they're doing yet are the two doors. Mm. You know, they're, Correct. Yep. They're, they're, they're buying cars back and then completely restoring them. Yes. Mm. And why is it, do you mm. think, Christoph, that the two door has so much more appeal than the four door? Is it just the fact it's the original? It's the original, thing. exactly right. Yeah. I think we see that in a lot of models mm. uh, and makes. You know, it, the original is, is the one that, you know, eventually becomes probably one of the most collectible and sought after. Yeah. So where does the four door sit in terms of desirability? Is, 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 can, can, is it ever going to match the two door in value? I don't think it will. Mm. I think, you know, that original two-door will probably always be the, the hero mm. of the fleet. It's remarkable to look at the evolution, though, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, over, over 25 years, that's Absolutely. a long model cycle. In the UK, even after they brought out the second generation, the P38A model, they kept yeah. making the Range Rover Classic, classic and selling yeah. that. That's, that's what Peugeot used to do. They mm. bring out the 403 and kept selling the 203. That shows a certain amount of faith in your product. And look, yeah. we saw so many variants come through mm. in, the, in the range, you know, the HSEs, SEs, LSEs, the Vogue. And the Vogue quite early yep. on. And, and we yeah. saw a, an engine capacity increase from 3.5 to 3.9. Correct, and then yeah. fuel injection as well fuel came injection. in. Um, so, so yeah, look, uh, th there's a lot of choice out there for, for people looking for something and I think to also suit, you know, their wallet as well. So, you know, realistically, what should a Range Rover collector be looking for in Australia? What, what would be... Uh, well, that would be the picking order. I think, we, we, you know, you start off with an early suffix A or suffix B yep. uh, two-door, um, followed by, you know, the late 70s two-doors in mm -hmm. the suffix C and Ds, uh, and then you'd go into a four-door, and then look for the late model uh, car, you know, 93, 94 okay. LSE or the Vogue, so I think they're a great package. And are these things that come through the Shannon's auctions, or is it more... Uh, we're starting to see some of the early stuff come through, absolutely. Okay. We've had a couple of two-doors come through. Um, we've seen, you know, the Royals have Range Rovers <laughs> from, from the early days, yeah. and, it, you know, we, we've seen them in movies, mm. and... Um, uh, so I think they, you know, there's a real close connection with people. Oh, that's very interesting, Chris. Hey, thanks for dropping by. No problem, guys. And remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's Auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. John, in closing, it's interesting. You said at the beginning of the show you rate the Range Rover as the second most significant car of the 20th century, obviously behind the, the Model T. Yes. Why, why well, do you feel that way? It's interesting because it was significant and influential. Think of the Citroen mm. DS. That was a very significant car, wasn't it? But it was not influential. No, it no didn't, one, didn't No influence. one followed it. Like yeah. the 911, no yeah. one said we can, we can do our version of sure. that. But the Range Rover made people think. Mm. And as we do this program, we're at the cusp of what looks like a permanent change away from conventional sedans and wagons to what, unfortunately, following the Americans, we call SUVs, for want of a better term. Mm. And the Range Rover really started that whole process. It's been going on now for, it gathered the momentum at the turn of the century. Mm. You know, BMW had the X5, then Ford did the territory, and they were all starting to get into that act. And now every manufacturer's got, just about every manufacturer's got one, two, three, four SUVs in their range. 
It is incredible, isn't it? When you mm. talk about the influence, you look at the, the global spread of the, as you say, the Absolutely. sport utility vehicle. Yep. yep. I mean, I know there was the Jeep version before, but I think in terms of the, the luxury element, the holistic design, I think the Range Rover's the one that did it. Well, the, the Toyota Land Cruiser would never have become the mm. vehicle it is now if it hadn't been for the Range Rover. That's one obvious example. Mm. Yeah, very influential machine. I think so. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the first generation Range Rover. We hope you can join us next time. Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.